Okay, so I got some questions here, and uh, I'll go ahead and read them and answer them. Uh, why do you encourage people to use this technology, and why did you do it? Um, well, I, I think really the idea of um, leveraging technology to better ourselves, augment ourselves, is nothing new. I mean, we're doing that since uh, human beings picked up rocks and sticks and uh, started using tools. Uh, you know, we're not the only species that, that are tool users. There are others here on this planet that are also considered tool users, birds that use sticks to eat, and um, apes, monkeys, and various uh, gorillas uh, do as well, and there's, there's many examples. But uh, we're now getting to the point where our technology is small enough and um, you know, kind of unobtrusive enough to be able to be integrated in the skin. So uh, on, on, on the physical and logical sense, the idea of, of leveraging technology uh, there, there, there's not really much of a difference between carrying a phone and putting something just under the skin. It's just, is it outside the skin or inside the skin? That's, so logically speaking, it's not a huge leap, but fundamentally there is a psychological difference and I think there's, uh, there's a difference in terms of uh, self-identity. And so you start talking about uh, people and their their sense of self. You know, when you have your phone or, or computer or whatever, laptop or any piece of technology, uh, you never really consider that to be part of who you are as a person, your your physical capabilities. There's no permanence uh, expectation there. So, um, you know, you, you put your phone down, you have to charge it, you lose it, or, you know, it's not with you at all times. So there's, it's definitely cognitively and, and psychologically, it's a tool that you use. But when you integrate uh, these technologies, it, it augments you as a human being. I now have the capability to communicate with machines, uh, or I have the capability to perform cryptography uh, with my cryptography implant. So um, there, uh, there, there's a fundamental difference there that I think is really important. And as we move forward as a human species, uh, we're, we're starting to change how evolution works. And um, evolution traditionally is selection and mutation. That selection could be natural or artificial. We could choose to breed dogs to create different species or different uh, breeds, um, but uh, but it's all selection. We're, we're not outside of that system. We're, we're part of nature and what we do is part of nature, so it's selection and mutation. But we've started opting out of certain selective processes. Medicine, uh, for example, is uh, helping us um, solve genetic problems and also, you know, just, um, you know, lethal deadly uh, diseases we're now surviving and so so we're kind of changing that selective process now with evolution and on the other hand you know the mutation side that's just random uh, but we're getting qu quickly becoming uh, capable of changing how mutations work and how evolution works fundamentally um, you know fundamentally speaking evolution requires a uh, generation to 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 give that random mutation a chance to to come into fruition um, you know, you're, you're set up with your genetic makeup, you have offspring, and that's a chance for mutation. So that's how evolution works. It's kind of slow. And we're rapidly approaching a time now where we can actually choose within our own lifespan to change our genetics, to change our capabilities as human beings through augmentations like these. So I'm encouraging people to look at this technology and, and experience it because, uh, you know, you can get an ear piercing, you can get a tattoo, uh, but you can also get an implant, and it's the same level of risk. Well, actually, it's less uh, than, than a tattoo or ear piercing. You often see uh, people with uh, infected tattoos or infected piercings or some problem like that, and we're, uh, you know, we're, we're still at, uh, I think, tens of thousands of in installs and um, maybe one infection uh, from somebody who did a self-install and messed it up. So, um, you know, you go to, you, you look at something like, how fundamental this technology changes your cognitive uh, understanding of yourself, your sense of self, and and kind of what it is to be human. I think probably uh, aside from the technology that we're creating and, and and you know and offering for sale, that probably the most important thing we're doing is preparing society for a rapid change in how technology is going to affect us as human beings and getting people to really consider uh, you know an augmented existence. Uh, so that's why I did it, and that's why I'm encouraging people to use it. Um, you know, I, I did it because, well, I did it mostly for uh, for being lazy. <laughs> uh, I didn't want to use um, my keys anymore. Um, we all have these things that we carry around, our keys and phones and probably wallets or, um, 
school bag, you know, whatever you've got. But you have to carry these things every day. They're a burden to carry. They're, you have to manage these things all the time. And so um, I was in a situation where I just didn't want to have to manage my keys. It was a thing where I would lock myself out constantly or I'd lose them. And I'd, it was just, um, or even when I didn't lose them, I just left the house or the office, I would have to manage these keys. And it was just something I didn't want to have to manage anymore. So I said, hey, I'll get an implant and use an RFID system to let myself in to my office. And, and that worked great. So um, then it kind of parlayed into, into dangerous things, what we're doing now. Uh, so next question, why do people call your ideas dangerous? Um, well, I, I called it dangerous things because I thought it was funny. Um, because people were saying, this is, this is crazy, this is dangerous. Um, and mind you, this was in 2005 when I first put this transponder in my left hand. Uh, so at the time, it was really unheard of, and the reactions were really kind of visceral and, and um, sometimes kind of violent, and uh, people were really, really un unhappy with it. Um, but I think the reason being is that, you know, the, the, the most education people get about this technology, even today, is through Hollywood movies, where some guy's got an implant, and they're going to shoot a missile uh, at this person or find them, locate them in real time, and, and like, nothing really... It doesn't work that way at all. It's not some kind of government tracking thing. It's not it just that's Hollywood, and but that's the only experience anybody's ever had with how implant these implants work. So I kind of don't blame them for being having that reaction, but they need to like break that down and go learn about what actually why it's useful, what's interesting about it, what it is and is not capable of. Um, but uh, yeah, so. I thought, if I'm going to name my company, I'm going to name it something. The, the, the name is going to be irrelevant uh, in, in convincing somebody to, to do this or not, right? I could have called it the safest things in the world .com, and the customers would have been the same, and the people that didn't want to do it would have been the same. It, it wouldn't make a difference. And so I thought it would be kind of uh, tongue-in-cheek to, to, to call it dangerous things. And, and uh, yeah, it's stuck. So I, I think it's kind of funny. Uh, can you unlock other people's cars and doors? Uh, well, no, because that would be a pretty terrible security system <laughs> if, if that was the case. Um, but uh, depending on permissions, right? So um, theoretically, I can unlock infinite uh, number of doors with this because this works somewhat like a security uh, identifier. So there's like a serial number, basically. Uh, and how normal keys and locks work, you have these you know, locks in, in the doors and then there's a key. It's a piece of metal with a cut pattern in it, and it's from like 700 BC, and it hasn't really changed much. The whole design of lock and key is kind of archaic. But how they work is you have a building with a ton of doors, right? And uh, you, you each door has a unique lock, and you need a key for that. So if you need 10 people to go through that door, they each need a copy of that key. So the key is copied to 10 people, and um, that's kind of an insecure thing. Once you once you copy a key and give it to somebody, that's, you know, you have no control over it. You've lost control. So uh, how these work is exactly the opposite. They, they have a serial number, and all the locks are the same. Uh, but each lock is programmed with a list of serial numbers. So if you want 10 or 100 people to be able to go through that door, you just put all of their individual serial numbers in that list. If you don't want this person to go through that door anymore, you take their serial number out of the list. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to redistribute keys to new people uh, like you do with physical keys. So um, and I, that serial number can be listed in an infinite number of lock lists. So um, it's, it's more efficient, I think, to, to use it that way. And uh, it just works really well. So if I want to be able to use somebody else's car or get into somebody else's door, then uh, I need to have them add my serial number to the list, and then I could totally do that. Uh, so yeah, let me know if you have any other questions. And uh, yeah, thanks.